Uh, Our reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 13, uh, and it's page 9, starts on page 978 if you're using a church Bible. Uh, We're continuing our series through Matthew 12 and 13 that will take us up to the end of this month. Uh, Just to say, obviously, you've probably now guessed the reason that Ian is preaching rather than me. Um, After the uh, news this week, uh, Ian is going to read one of the sources that I had gathered for preparation purposes. So most of what he says is somebody else's, uh, and we can point to the source if you want to. He has done some work uh, tweaking it and just putting it in his own voice in places. Um, But obviously that's part of just stepping and filling the gap when all of a sudden... um, Preparation didn't really have time to happen this week. Well, good morning. This morning, as you've probably gathered, we're going to look at the parable of the sower, as it's known. Although, it might just as well be called the parable of the soils. Because its focus is a, diff- is a range of different kinds of ground and how productive they are when you sow exactly the same kind of seed in each one. But as Jesus spells out, this is not a Monty Don masterclass, or for you Radio 4 fans, a Bob Flowered You Gardener's Question Time. In how to win the gold rosette at your village show with your monster leeks. Mind you, if anybody's got any gardening tips, they can pass them on to someone who cares about gardening, and that's not got a garden made of pebbles, chipping and patio paving. That's mine. So I don't do gardening. No, this is about people, not parsnips. It's about us. Of course, in the hot, dry world of first century Palestine, as in many parts of the world today, the question of the success of the crop is not about prize rosettes, nor even about improved profit margins. It's a matter of physical life and death. Not enough crop equals not enough food. Not enough food equals famine. Famine equals death for some. In Jesus' teaching, in, in Jesus' teaching in this parable, the issue is even more serious than physical survival. What's at stake is not physical life, it's eternal life. Unproductive soil is equivalent to hell bound people. Productive soil is heaven-bound people who are bringing others with them. The seed being sown, says Jesus in verse 19, is the message about the kingdom of God. And since Jesus is the king of said kingdom, that means the seed stands for the good news that Jesus has come to claim his kingdom. And that includes the whole of our lives. Now you might think the coming of the king would be universally acknowledged and acclaimed. But that's not the way it is, is it? The the reality that we see all around us is that the message about King Jesus generates a wide range of responses, many of them unfavourable. What Jesus does in this parable is to help us see what's happening as the message about him is spread around the place. So what I'm going to do is ask three questions and find answers to them in this parable of the soils and the seed. Firstly, how do people react to the word of God? Secondly, why do they react in that way? And thirdly, how should we react to this parable? So firstly, how do people react to the word of God? What Jesus is telling us here is that we can expect basically three different reactions to the message. Some will say no, some will say yes, but, and others will say an enthusiastic and consistent yes. To be sure, there are four different kinds of soil in this parable, each of them representing a different kind of reaction to the word, but two of them fall into the category of yes, but. Talking to those who say no is like sowing seed on a much trampled and compacted pathway, or like my garden, concrete. 
it's not concrete is it it's paving stones but the same thing it gets nowhere this is anyone who in verse ni- any, any, anyone who verse 19 says hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it it's not that they don't hear these are people who are told about Jesus their ears work fine they get the message but it goes in one ear and out the other if they are polite and courteous types they might even say and I've had this said to me I understand what you're saying but you immediately know that they mean the very opposite they don't get it at all because if you do get it about Jesus your life is never the same again and these people just don't budge an inch they're impervious in fact you can gently keep reminding them about the kingdom year after year after year but it makes no difference we've got fam- we had family like that didn't we in one ear and out the other but they don't change some may come to church week in week out but they don't change it's as if they have an invisible Star Trek like deflector shield like a bubble around them that protects them from being affected by the invitation of Jesus to come to him they're here but they're deaf do you know these kind of people I know I do if you love them dearly their reaction or non-reaction can be very hard to take or maybe your own defenses are beginning to slip and you are glimpsing the fact that you have been like that sorry you are glimpsing the fact that you've been like that up till now maybe that's you it's never too late to change both rocky places without much soil and also the thorn covered ground are the yes but types and that's verse 20 the one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy and verse 22 the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word but worries about this this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it making it unfruitful what was sown among thorns is the man who hears the word but they take Jesus on board they respond to him positively even maybe with great enthusiasm but then they change if you've been praying for them and you then you are tremendously encouraged to see their growing faith in Christ for a while but in time short or long it all begins to go wrong like Martin's interest in the Star Wars universe or Doctor Who or like my waning appreciation of the Marvel Cinematic Universe Jesus eventually becomes just a phase that was passed a long time ago other things take over I wonder if you have said yes to Jesus in the past and there is a but just beginning to form in your mind and taking shape on your lips the good soil stands for those who say an enthusiastic consistent yes to Jesus and who keep on saying yes verse 23 the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it he produces a crop a crop yielding a hundred sixty or thirty times what was sown for such people faith in Christ is not a curious if interesting mental aberration slightly to be pitied nor is it a passing phase that will be consigned to the fading photos of the family album fondly remembered maybe but definitely not around any longer like an old friend who you still somehow think of as a friend but you haven't seen for ages no people who are good soil for people who are good soil faith in Christ is life and health and peace it is Jesus who is there in the driving seat and they wouldn't have it any other way so who's driving you So how do you react to the word of God? Jesus says either with a no or with a yes but or an enthusiastic and consistent yes. But my second question is why do they react the way they do? 
Well, Jesus says that each response to the message about him has a different underlying reason. People say no because of sin and Satan. They say yes but because of sin and the world. They say an enthusiastic and consistent yes because of God. Jesus talks about why people respond as they do in his explanation to the disciples of the meaning of this parable in verses 18 to 23. But he also talks about it in, talks about it in his explanation of his use of parables in general, which is in verses 1 to 10. We need to listen to both bits of teaching together. The one helps us understand the other. What about those who say no? Verse 19. There are two factors here. The failure to understand is reinforced by the work of the devil. Why the in one ear and out the other syndrome? Jesus quotes what God says through the prophet Isaiah in verse 15. For this people's heart have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. They are deaf and blind to the truth about Jesus. This is what they've chosen to be. It's something they are powerless to change. At the root of it all is a calloused or hardened heart. A heart that's been so cooled by the chill winds of rejection of Jesus that it has frozen hard against him. It is a heart that no longer feels his love nor fears God, God's anger. That's what sin is all about. It's frighteningly dangerous. It's a frighteningly dangerous condition to be in. And the freezing process is greatly accelerated by the evil activity of Satan. He hates Jesus. He hates people. He lies continuously and very plausibly. Like the evil flock of birds so graphically portrayed in that classic Alfred Hitchcock film, the devil swoops down and snatches the life-giving word of God out of people's minds because he wants them dead for all eternity. So much rejection of Jesus in our society is cloaked with politeness and tolerance. But according to Jesus, underneath that pleasant front lies frozen hearts and supernatural evil. We mustn't be under any illusions. Telling people about Jesus is spiritual warfare. Many people are deeply dug in, heavily defended, and with strong air support from the powers of evil. What about those who say yes but? Well there are two sorts. Both responses are caused partly by the same kind of hardening of the heart we've already spoke about. Both are partly caused by the impact of the word on fledging faith. But the pressure of the world applies two different forms. One is represented by rocky places, the other by thorny ground. Verses 20 to 21. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, it, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. When you come under pressure because of your faith, there is one surefire way of relieving that pressure. Give up your faith. For many around the world, this is a matter of facing physical hardship and suffering. Millions of Christians around the world could bring about a major improvement in their physical and economic welfare and that of their families if they just soften or drop their allegiance to Christ. Many do. Their response to Jesus was only ever shallow. The burning midday sun comes up and they can't take the heat. Mind you, we're not in a position of superiority, are we? Although the pressures on us are more subtle and less frightening, we, the church in this country, have for decades backed off whenever the world has advanced towards us. How can you believe that? We're asked. How can you think that? We're told. That's the taunt. And far too often we've said to the world, oh well then, we don't want any aggro, and quietly amend what Jesus, Jesus has taught us. We'll gently relegate him to the sidelines, 
we'll go along with you. And before you know it, robust biblical faith in Christ has withered and died in too many hearts. What's more, the world's attack on, Christian, on the Christian faith is on two fronts. Trouble or persecution as a direct result of faithfulness in, to the gospel is one. The other is what Jesus pictures as, th as the thorns in verse 22. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but, wor the, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. This is not direct pressure on our Christian faith. This is simply becoming so preoccupied with our earthly lives that we lose all eternal perspective. Now I'm not making a prediction here, this is only an illustration. But it's as if a bridegroom, the day before his wedding, had to drive a long way from his bachelor home, in Sheffield say, and he decides to take a break at motorway services. He browses in the w in WH Smith at the magazines, then settles into a Burger King. That doesn't sound like anybody we know, does it? And he rather likes it, so he decides to book into the travel lodge and continue on his journey the next morning. But when he wakes up, it's a fantastic day, and he's preoccupied with getting breakfast. Maybe he's used to Weatherspoon's breakfasts, I don't know. And then the sun comes out, and there's some great walking nearby, so he goes for a stroll. And he completely forgets about his wedding that day. So he heads back to his bachelor pad in, say, Sheffield. There's just this nagging doubt in his mind that maybe he should be somewhere else. I don't know, maybe in the Midlands somewhere, I don't know, perhaps. But there's a big deadline coming up, so he dismisses such thoughts and goes back to work. Ridiculous? Yes, yes. Impossible? No. Christians do the equivalent of this all the time. Our earthly preoccupations fill our minds and our time and our energy so much that we end up forgetting where we're heading. And to make that illustration personal, my main failing is watching American TV. I love cop shows. And I, the time I can spend watching cop shows can easily suck the whole time out of my day. It's so easy to be distracted and preoccupied. It really is. Lost my place now, doing that illustration, which I hadn't written down. So all our earthly preoccupations fill our minds and our time and our energy that we end up forgetting where we're heading. We turn back. And as far as the kingdom of God is concerned, our lives come to nothing. Now that's worse than ridiculous. So let's not forget don't let worries or wealth or anything choke the living faith out of you. So what then does Jesus say about those who say an enthusiastic and consistent yes to him and his word? Why do people do that? Verse 23. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. Why do such, why do such people take the message on board? Is it some virtue in them? Something in their makeup to be religious? Some built in goodness? Absolutely not. Left to ourselves, we all choose to turn our backs on Jesus. We all have hardened and unresponsive hearts. But God works a miracle. Look, what hap look, look at what Jesus says to his disciples in verse 11. He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, not to them. Consistent faith, a consistent saying yes, is God's gift. It is the result of his life-transforming grace at work in our hearts. He overcomes our sinful and rebellious nature and makes our hearts warm towards him. He defeats all the efforts of Satan to destroy our faith. He strengthens us to withstand the pressures and preoccupations that the world puts in our path. And when God works like that, what's the result? Fruitful lives. Lives that count for the kingdom. See verse 23. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Is Jesus exaggerating the impact that consistent faith can have on those around us? Imagine the contrast between two sunflowers. One, after six months in good soil, 
that, a, that, that one small seed might have grown into a plant nine feet tall with a flower head packed tight with maybe 1,800 new seeds. And this is, I've, I've, I don't know about this because I'm not a gardener, but I, I believe this might be right. Capable of producing more sunflowers. And you know who did that, don't you? God did that. Compare that with a set of seeds planted in poor soil and not getting more than three inches high before they got dyed or eaten. See the difference between good and bad soil? Now we are not all the spiritual equivalents of sunflowers. I'm not saying that, and that's fine. What God wants us, what God wants is a crop that we were designed for. But when Jesus speaks of a crop of up to a hundred times what was sown, that's no exaggeration. That's how God works. A century is one long lifetime. Twenty lifetimes ago, there was one small band of disciples in the whole world. Today, there are hundreds and hundreds of millions. And the crop is increasing all the time. Such is the power of the transforming grace of God in our lives. So, the final question then. How should we react to this parable? There's four things we can do. Understand other people's reactions to the gospel. We need to have an optimistic realism about the effect of telling others about Jesus. Jesus himself warns us that there will be many no's and, and many yes buts. But there will also be the enthusiastic and consistent yeses. And through them the kingdom will multiply and multiply and nothing will be able to stop it. Secondly, identify your own reactions to Jesus. How are you behaving towards him in your life at the moment? Never mind what you've done in the past. More important is what you do from now. Thirdly, ask God for his, transform, his transforming grace. If you really want it, then that's a sign that the Spirit is at work within you. Ask for more. And keep on and on asking that your life will be good ground in which the word can flourish and bear fruit. Fourthly, keep on listening to and telling others the message about the kingdom. We need to be fertile, weed-free ground. But we also need to have a place as God's farm labourers. We are to sow the seed of the gospel whenever and wherever we can. The future holds many opportunities. And I know you don't want to think about it just now, but Christmas is coming. And that will give us fantastic opportunities to invite people to church, to meetings, to the carol service. There's loads of things we're doing. So, you know, be thinking about that, be praying about that. We need to be praying for the boldness and the grace to take every opportunity that God gives us. Amen. I just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a gracious and wise God you are to allow people to choose life or death, heaven or hell, forgiveness or condemnation as a matter of free will. Thank you for the light of the gospel of grace and for opening our eyes to its truth. Please have mercy on those who, who of their own choice, choose the path of death, destruction and condemnation. Continue to open our eyes to the truth and help us to choose the good and reject evil. And reveal to those rebellious people the horrific consequences of rejecting the gospel of Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.